Hello, hello, and welcome once again to another episode of Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly podcast show on the Beatles in which we cover everything, their years together, their solo years, their history, their music, what's going on in the news. Anything that comes to mind, we can talk about it right here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three co-hosts of this podcast. You might know me for several things. I have my own YouTube channel these days called Ken Michaels Radio with interviews with people in the Beatle world. I have a syndicated radio show called Debbie Little Thing right now airing on over 50 radio stations. And um, in addition to that, another podcast show, a bi-weekly show, which is all about the solo careers of the Beatles called Talk More Talk, the solo Beatles video cast. And I'm being joined by my two regular co-hosts. First of all, a man who's written a couple of books and is busy on his third and more uh, in the Beatle world. He's written Got That Something, How the Beatles' I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and also uh, The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and his latest book, The McCartney Legacy, the first volume of which is due out in December. And that's with uh, Adrian Sinclair, his Mm co-author. Welcome, Alan Cozen. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone out there in podcast land. (laughs) And also, we have Darren DeVivo, who has been manning the fort at New York's WFUV for nearly 40 years. And, you know, it's a miracle in this day and age when you're working for the same company for a long time. It's 10 times a greater miracle if it's anyone in radio or television yeah. who stays on this, at the same company for that long. And uh, I mean, that's just so rare. And uh, a great host on the air, great DJ, Darren DeVivo. Welcome. Thank you, Ken. Hello, Alan. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for uh, watching. On today's show, um, we're doing a special tribute to Ringo Starr because most recently he celebrated his 82nd birthday on July the 7th. So uh, the three of us have decided that we're going to list five songs that we feel have been overlooked or underappreciated in Ringo Starr's solo uh, catalog. Now, you might be aware that on my other podcast, we just did something very similar, but a little bit more specific. Five songs overlooked or underappreciated from Ringo from 2000 to the present the last two decades but on this show we're expanding it to his entire solo catalog maybe there are certain songs that you feel are really strong that most people don't even know uh album cuts even singles that didn't get the airplay that you think they deserve but we're going to be tackling all that in just a few moments but as usual we do have beetle news to get to not as much as we normally do but it all starts with news that a, a big congratulations will go out to the team that gave us the Get Back documentary as it's been nominated for five Emmy Awards, including Outstanding Documentary or Nonfiction Series, Peter Jackson for Outstanding Directing for a Documentary Nonfiction Program, Outstanding Picture Editing for a Nonfiction Program, Outstanding sound mixing for a nonfiction or reality program, and outstanding sound editing for a nonfiction or reality program. And on the subject of the Emmy Awards, the McCartney 321 documentary was actually nominated for three Emmy Awards for sound editing, sound mixing, and cinematography. And the awards are planned to be held on September the 12th. This will be at the Microsoft Theater in downtown Los Angeles. So congratulations. We just mentioned Get Back before the documentary directed by Peter Jackson and the DVD and Blu-ray was officially released on July the 12th. I still haven't gotten around to getting my copy, but uh, I know Alan has his, Darren also got his, but um, Alan wanted to make a few comments about what he observed about it. Yeah, I didn't uh, get, I didn't watch the whole thing. I, I just sort of sampled it. Um, but so, you know, first of all, you know, it's it comes with this wraparound thing like a lot of things do these days. And 
naturally, even if you fold down the front, it's too big to put in the box. <laughs> Come on, give us a break. Mm -hmm. um, I guess they expect most people to throw it out, but you know, I mean, they're selling these to lunatic collectors like me and we want to keep this. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is of course, you know, as you know, there's no bonus material at all. Um, it's just the three DVDs um, or, or Blu-rays, uh, just like the three nights of the Disney Plus presentation. And, uh, you know, it looks good. It sounds good. It's uh, got a lot of, of sound options, uh, 7.1, Atmos, um, and various stereo, stereo with descriptions, which I, I didn't bother with because for the moment I can still see. So, um, <clears throat> but um, I listened to the Atmos and um, it, it, it sounded good. Uh, I, I did find, however, that, I mean, one thing I wanted to listen to first was the rooftop concert. Um, and, you know, I watched a few minutes of it, but having watched this entire program, maybe eight or nine times by now, I mainly was playing the Blu-ray to check on the sound and, and the mixes. And uh, so I, put it on and was doing some other things. And here's the thing, you know, I thought that um, even if they weren't going to give us actual bonus material, it would have made sense to just give us a section of the rooftop concert, just as the concert without the people downstairs, without the cops, just play that concert, you know, just have it as an alternate section as a bonus thing on the DVD. Okay. That to me seemed the minimal they should do. I mean, what I really want is the other 52 hours of, um, you know, Nagras and whatever film they have, but okay, fine. I would have settled for just the rooftop concert without the other stuff going on watching it. The other stuff going on is pretty interesting. I and mean, even after several times I I've, I've liked, the way it was edited and the way it was done as a TV documentary. Listening to it while doing something else and listening to it as a concert, all those people telling us what they do or don't like about the Beatles and how, you know, people are complaining to the police and all that stuff. It's just annoying. It's really annoying, you know? So this isn't really a set that you can have on in the background simply for the audio, the way you might have a, boot, a bootleg of the rooftop concert, for instance. Um, but I guess, you know, it's something that you really have to watch for it to be as interesting as it's supposed to be. Um, so that's basically my comment on that. I mean, the sound I thought was really pretty good. It does give you an option for subtitles, which... Um, um, I didn't try getting when I watched it on Disney. I don't know if they're there, but I, I do know that I've read people's comments um, online saying about the Disney that, you know, they wish there were subtitles for more of it. You know, Peter put some on where I think he thought that it wasn't going to be clear. Um, <clears throat> but now you can apparently get subtitles for the whole thing. And, uh, you know, that might be interesting. I mean, sometime I might, I might watch it with that you know, just to, you know, catch other bits of dialogue that go by kind of quickly. But um, yeah, so there it is. The only extras you get are these four pictures. Can't even say the really spectacular pictures of the Beatles as let it be potential pictures go. But anyway, that's the big bonus you get. Hmm. Well, you know, I was saying around the time when when we were watching this, you know, one of the things I was looking forward to was to see the rooftop concert without the people in the street. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, some people were critical of me for making those comments. But, you know, it's nice to have it as part of a documentary. But why can't we just get the pure concert as a bonus feature? Like you said, definitely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I definitely sympathize with what you were saying there. The price of the DVD is only $45. Yeah. Uh, which is actually very, very reasonable. That's true. 
I'll give them uh, that. <laughs> Alan, you were you were you were you were pleased with the audio. Yeah. Because I read a few really brutal reviews. Really? Um, and I don't remember where they were. They actually I didn't even I didn't even finish reading them because I actually were like, oh man, it kind of like that's a bummer. You know, because the issues. Looking, excuse me. What were the issues? I, I don't remember I saw where I saw them. Uh, one of them was a tech publication, whether it was like an e-magazine um, uh, where they were really lacing into it. A lot of tech talk that I didn't understand. Hmm. I didn't read the whole thing, but just came away thinking like, oh, don't tell me they're going to put out a, a subpar product. Um, bad enough that we're not getting any extras and like you just showed the extras. I don't even think you get those cards. If you, those pictures, if you get the blue of uh, the DVD. Really? Hmm. I'm not sure about that. I think those cards may just be a, a Blu-ray exclusive. But Ken, do you order? Yeah, I know you didn't get it yet, but. No. I just intended on getting it at a local store that I know would have it. So, and I would get the DVD. Yeah. I'm not sure about the car, the uh, photos. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I think the, the DVD is not going to come with the photos. Mm -hmm. But anyway, the only thing that I would really complain about, aside from the rooftop concert, which I would want just by itself, would be that I would want some bonus material. And you would think that a lot of fans already have made themselves, made themselves get access to the files that they already have in their hard drives. So to make it worth your while to buy it, one thing you should do is just put some extra material in there. Even if all you gave was 10 minutes, I would have been happy. Mm -hmm. But, um, well, I would have liked to see them open up some of the things that we only got excerpts of, like, you know, Susie's Parlor or, you know, some of the other things that we all know and love from Bootleg and would have been fun to see the whole performance. Um, I'd, I'd have liked to see some of those opened up. Plus, all the stuff on the final day of shooting, you know, I think he gave us really sort of a, a quick run of excerpts because Michael Lindsay Hogg had given us the whole thing, you know, all the, all the performances. Um, but in the absence of the original, let it be, um, it would have been nice to have those, all those performances there too. Mm. Good point. It does look as though if you go by the packaging that, the Blu-ray is referred to as a collector's set. So, and you get the cards. Yeah, that's what they say. Yeah. Blu-ray collector set. But, All right. In this All handy right. thing that... You <laughs> <laughs> well, let's move on with more news here. Um, along with the new documentary for the Beatles Get Back, you might recall there was another documentary that Paul McCartney released in 1991 of the same title, which happened to be directed by Richard Lester. And now we hear it's going to be re-released on DVD and Blu-ray. It includes performances of the songs that Paul and his band at the time performed on their 1989-90 tour with lots of Beatles songs, also Wings classics, and songs from the then new album, Flowers in the Dirt. The re-release of Paul's Get Back comes out in August. Some brand new merchandise is now for sale to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Wings Over Europe tour of July and August of 1972, in which they gave 26 concerts. This includes a solid metal desktop sculpture with the iconic 3D Wings logo displayed on a laser engraved marble base. Only 50 were made available. Also for sale are exclusive t-shirts, hoodies, and tote bags. Alan, did you try and get the, um, the sculpture? No. I'm surprised. I mean, I'm hearing about it now, Ken. Okay. Wow. That's, that's going to end up being something very valuable. Only 50 made. Yeah. Uh, the Daily Mail spotted Paul on holiday in the Hamptons, where he was swimming with his daughter, Beatrice, who is now 18 years old from his second marriage with Heather Mills. Rolling Stone Magazine just came out with their latest list of their top 500 songs of all time. I didn't get to look at the entire list, but in their top 20, number 20 was Let It Be, 
Number 16, I want to hold your hand. Number 13, Yesterday. Number 8, Hey Jude. And the highest ranking Beatle or solo Beatle song happened to be Imagine, which came in at number three. Mm. And if you're curious, number two, the number two song was Satisfaction. The number one song, Like a Rolling Stone. Huh. Okay. Recently, Julian Lennon <laughs> produced a documentary on the environment called Kiss the Ground which was narrated by Woody Harrelson and it ran on Netflix. The DVD and Blu-ray are now being offered for free on the documentary's website. However, it will cost you $12 for postage, which still seems like a good deal to me. Just go to kissthegroundmovie.com for more information. In a new interview that I just did with Beatles author Ken Womack, he revealed a few months ago that there will be two books coming out that he's worked on concerning Beatles roadie and loyal friend, Mal Evans. He told me the first book is a full-length biography, heavily illustrated, and Ken uh, said that he thinks it's the longest single book he's written with over 200,000 words. Hopefully it will be out next Father's Day. The second one, which will include Mal's diaries, manuscripts, and the book he was working on uh, when he was killed, uh, which Ken says was completed. And there's also material from his personal archives uh, that will all be coming out approximately a year later. Okay, you can watch this new interview that I did with Ken on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. Uh, one new book, which will be coming out next year is called Good Day Sunshine State. <laughs> How the Beatles Rocked Florida. It's by Bob Keeling, and it's due out on paperback on March the 7th next year. All right, that is all the news that we have for you this time. And like I said a few moments ago, our show this time is a tribute to Ringo Starr for his 82nd birthday, which happened on uh, July the 7th. And we're each going to list what we feel are five songs from Ringo's solo catalog that we feel really deserve more attention. They've either been overlooked or underappreciated. It could be anything from the beginning of his solo career, from Sentimental Journey to his last two EPs. So why don't we start, first of all, and get um, Alan's list. Okay. Um, so, you know, with Ringo, I think the, the last show we did five of Paul's underappreciated things. And, um, you know, in a way, it's a lot easier to find them with Ringo because there's a degree to which his entire catalog is pretty much underappreciated except for, you know, hit singles. Um, and, you know, I, I can kind of understand why, uh, you know, I, I, I like Ringo. I like most of his records um, when I listen to them, but getting motivated to listen to a Ringo record is something that um, it, it, I don't know, for some reason, it's just not something that normally occurs to me. Um, I don't mean that as any kind of slight on Ringo, but if I'm putting on a record, uh, you know, unless we're doing a show that has something to do about Ringo or if the record is new, and I need to hear it, you know, hear what's going on. Um, I, I tend not to just put them on and, you know, maybe I should try it, you know, because I enjoy them when I hear them. But um, this is also, you know, this, is, this may have to do also with the fact that I'm not sort of like a normal person. I mean, I have my, my equivalent of iTunes, which I use Media Monkey, has 500,000 tracks on it. And that's a fraction of my collection. Um, and I sometimes really look back at like when I was a teenager and had, you know, 200 albums, it was much easier to figure out what I wanted to listen to when, when the selection was a lot smaller, you know? Um, and now things just don't get listened to as much because there's so many other things competing. But so with Ringo, you know, we, we, we talked about this a few weeks ago, so I had some, some time to do it. And um, I think I've come up with some, you know, actual rarities, <laughs> starting with living in a pet shop. Huh. 
<laughs> okay. From an album called Scouse the Mouse, which was, uh, you know, I think it's only a British release. I don't know if it ever came out here. I doubt it. I don't think so. Yeah, it was a soundtrack to a like TV special. Um, but you know, it's a cute song. In fact, he has he has a, a bunch of songs from that show, and and they're all kind of fun. Living in a pet shop, I thought, was a, a really good representative of that. Um, if you can find it out there on YouTube or someplace else and give it a spin, uh, maybe it'll point you towards finding um, Scouse the Mouse. Um, the second one, you know, not so rare, I don't think, but I don't know if anyone ever plays it. A Man Like Me from Bad Boy. Um, you know, I really liked that Ringo television special that he yeah. did. Uh, that is something that really he should put out. You know, it's not it's it's not like it's the most you know stunning amazing thing going but it's a lot of fun it had carrie fisher it had uh you know ed norton <laughs> Art carney Art carney um uh angie dickinson mm -hmm. uh george is in it briefly uh you know for people who don't know just briefly it, it's it's one of these like prince and the pauper kind of things you know where there's he plays two roles ringo and Agna rats uh, and they switch places. It's anyway, there, and there's a concert scene at the end and it included a man like me. Um, and I might've heard it there even before I got that album. Um, and I really kind of liked it and, uh, and, and, and I still sort of do. So and actually, Alan, um, a man like me originally mm -hmm. was from Scouse the Mouse. It was well, a, a mouse, mouse like me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Slight change in the words. But, in fact, uh, I considered including a mouse like me, and then I thought, no, why don't I include a man like me? <laughs> we can have some grown-up tracks here. Okay. So, <laughs> um, so my third one, we're doing five, right? Yep. My third one was Mr. Double It Up, which was a B-side from the Vertical Man era, and then it ended up as a bonus track on Vertical Man. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, a, an energetic track. It's, you know, he, he sings okay on it. It's got a, a really good sound, uh, good band behind him. And um, at the end, during the play out, there's a, a bit of, with a little help from my friends. Um, I, I thought it was a, you know, as B-sides go, uh, it was a pretty worthy track. Hmm. The fourth one is Give Me Back the Beat from Choose Love. Nice. Yeah. Choose Love's one of those records that doesn't get played a lot, I don't think. You know, I mean, basically when it comes down to it, when people do play a Ringo record, it's usually Ringo, the third album. Or a good night piano. First album, depending how you... Uh, yeah, and, and a couple of, you know, of others. Uh, but... Choose Love, I think, uh, has been sort of lost in the shuffle. And it's got a lot of good stuff on it, actually. Um, and finally, Give It a Try from Liverpool 8. Um, that one, you know, his singing is a little bit strained, uh, sort of, you know, towards the top end. Um, he, he, he strains to reach, reach some notes. But um, nevertheless... Um, I think it's a very charismatic track, you know, everybody has a dream that they hold on to kind of thing, you know, really nice melody. Um, and in fact, the melody has, you know, there, there are certain turns in it that have this sort of early Mersey beat kind of feeling in a way, you know, instrumentally, it doesn't sound like an, an early Mersey beat track because it's more of a modern heavy sound, but the, the melody goes there and it just sort of calls that to mind. So those are my five Ringo tracks. Okay. Um, just a question or two here. When you do listen to a Ringo album, hmm. are you listening mainly to see, well, you know, a lot of people first and, and foremost think of him as a drummer. Are you listening for his drumming on the record? Are you listening to see any kind of progress that he's made as a songwriter? Because, you know, ever since, even though he wrote in the 70s with Vinnie Poncia and a few songs with George Harrison, from Vertical Man on, 
nearly every single song on a Ringo album has been a co-write. And it's been a you know, fascinating part, at least for me, in following Ringo with Mark Hudson and the Roundheads and all the various people post Mark Hudson. Do you find that aspect of his, of his career interesting? Do you follow that? Or are you just looking for an album you're hoping to enjoy from Ringo? It's more like the latter, but I, I do listen to the, you know, the compositions and the singing uh, more than the drumming. I, I'm not sure I focus that much on the drumming on, on his recent records. Um, I probably should do that, you know, because um, his drumming on Beatles things is, is I, I've really come to appreciate a lot in relatively recent years, more than, you know, than when they were new. Um, because I've come to have more of an appreciation of drummers in general right? than I did, you know, I mean, back then when I was playing in bands, drummers were always the, the pain in the butt in the group, you know, they were always the ones who, you know, wanted their name on the drum, even if it wasn't their group really. And they wanted to, you know, you got the uh, nice little acoustic song. This is where they want to do the drum solo. <laughs> you know like that but so now that i'm not really working that much with drummers i i feel i can appreciate them better and and listening to ringo with the beatles um especially on a lot of the reissues recently like pepper and and the white album i've 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 really gotten a a, a new appreciation of what he did as a drummer um and yet with his solo albums i haven't really focused on drums that much um i've just listened more generally to the you know, the sound, the songs, the, you know, his voice, which is, you know, we've talked about this before. He's not, you know, as, as he said himself, you know, I'm not Pavarotti. Um, but he has a very charismatic voice with a, a, you know, a definite, a definite sound that is recognizably Ringo after like an eighth of a second. Right. You know? So, um, you know, I enjoy that when I, when I do put one on, you know. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, ultimately, you know, for me, I, I listen for the whole experience of whether I like the song first. But I think one of the things that I appreciate about Ringo and his solo career, especially since the 70s, in the 70s, very often he double drum with Jim Keltner. And who's right. to argue Jim Keltner is one of the greatest drummers and session drummers of all time. Right. But it would have been nice. So I, my ears can pick apart what's Ringo playing, what's Jim playing. But once you started working, say, from, uh, well, definitely from, from Time Takes Time On, he's been the only drummer mm -hmm. on his records um, in most cases. Um, so you can zero in on the drumming there. And I know that his drumming has been mixed a little bit hotter, so you can really get to hear what he's playing. And mm -hmm. some of his drumming has been outstanding, especially on the Mark Hudson uh, produced albums and post Mark Hudson. So if you if it really matters to you to hear Ringo as a drummer, I would definitely advise mm -hmm. you to go in that direction. But you know, ultimately, at least in my case, you know, I I listen in totality. I care a lot about all the progress that I feel Ringo's made as a songwriter, and you know, not only working with George Harrison, Vinnie Poncia, Mark Hudson, all the different people post Mark Hudson, from Dave Stewart to Van Dyke Parks and Richard Marks sure. and Gary Burr and all those people, you know, very yeah. talented songwriters. Um, you know, certainly that's what keeps me interested in Ringo's in Ringo's uh, solo catalog. Yeah, I wanted to add, actually, I mean, I, I know this will sound almost contradictory, having said, you know, I don't just tend to put on a Ringo <laughs> record. Mm for the hell of it. Um, I do think that, you know, when I have in the past listened to all of his stuff, you know, sequentially or, or whatever, I, I kind of feel like Roto Gravure and Bad Boy have had a bad rap. I don't think they're, I don't think they're as bad as people seem to to feel. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, recently some, well, actually it might've been, might have been Darren in, in when we were discussing what to talk about, about the, the question about why did Ringo's popularity sort of fall off after Goodnight Vienna, yeah. maybe. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I, I don't think those albums are 
really that bad, you know, and, uh, you know, bad boy has a man like me on, it was one of my picks. So, um, yeah, I was, I was just listening to bad boy a few days ago, just for the heck of it. I just picked it at random. One of the albums that I probably listened to the least for no reason, just, you know, and I was listening to it go, you know, bad boy's not bad at all. Um, and uh, I've always felt that Rotogravure had to survive the comparisons to Goodnight Vienna and Ringo because they were sort of cut from the same cloth. Um, I was, always looked at Rotogravure as being hit and miss. I was surprised that, uh, and I don't know how long it's been since I listened to Bad Boy from start to finish at, you know, all right, here's an album that, that in my opinion, that's an album that's got a bad rap. Mm-hmm. You know, it was Bad Boy. Hmm. I mean, I've always felt the three lowest in my book of Ringo albums was Ringo the Fourth, Stop and Smell the Roses, and Old Wave. Um, hmm. But anyway, that's, you know, but Bad Boy is definitely worth a, re, a re-evaluation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, if anyone is interested yeah. on my other podcast show, Talk More Talk, not that long ago, we did a show on that very same topic. Why did Ringo's career take a die right after Goodnight Vienna? And we had all different opinions from my okay. co-hosts on the show. You might want to check that out. And maybe sometime in the near future, we'll do a show on the same topic. But yeah, it's yeah. always been my contention that, yeah, there's, it's very hard to top the Ringo album. And I like Goodnight Vienna, but it's not like when Ringo's Rotogravure came out or Ringo the Fourth or Bad Boy that I thought those albums were so much weaker than Goodnight Vienna. They're not as good as Ringo. You know, I don't, I didn't really see a decline in the quality as much, but there's a lot of reasons why records sell and why they don't sell. It's a very complex thing and we can all pose our own theories where Ringo is concerned and maybe we'll do that in a future show here. I think that's mm-hmm. a great topic. We yeah. all have different opinions about it. Anyway, Darren, I know you have your five. That you yes, wanted. I do. And uh, I really liked Alan's list because Alan really dig, did dig super deep and came up with uh, uh, songs that uh, are underappreciated or deep tracks. These, those were some of those were really deep tracks that Alan picked. Mine are a little closer to the surface. Uh, I did, um, there was a couple of things that I almost picked for my top five. Uh, I'll list again. If we did this show a month from today, I probably would have a completely different list hmm. uh, of songs pulled together. But a couple of thing, songs that I was considering included two off Rotogravure, his covers of Hey Baby and A Dose of Rock and Roll. Then I thought, all right, those were singles. In fact, A Dose of Rock and Roll cracked the top 40. Um so maybe I should take those out because they were singles because I don't think the one, yeah, the five that I settled on were not singles. So I thought, all right, let's take the singles out. That included Weight of the World, another one that I considered because if there ever was a song of Ringo's that should have been a hit and maybe because it came out in the early 90s, uh, Weight of the World is, is one that had smash all over and i remember when i heard it for the first time Mm. uh i thought to myself i cannot believe that ringo's got a cloud nine on him on his hands you know the way cloud nine came out and boom george harrison was everywhere Mm -hmm. didn't see that one coming Mm -hmm. i thought i was going to be one of only five people buying cloud nine when i heard it was coming out because that's what happened with gontrapo you know when i heard weight of the world i thought Ringo is going to be front and center in the early nineties. I love it. And it didn't happen. Um, But that, but that was a single. And that also said, you know what, let me push this to the side. Snookaroo was a single overseas. And a lot of people know Snookaroo. So I wouldn't say that that's necessarily a a deep track. Well, Snookaroo was also the flip side of the no, no song. And it's often been listed as a double sided hit. And even right. though I didn't really hear Snookaroo on AM radio, and I listened no. to it back then, I did hear it on FM radio. So What I am going to go with, though, in my list here, does skew heavily towards 
the more recent years. And in my mind, Ringo's more recent years starts with Time Takes Time. I don't know why that's a dividing. I think everybody sort of looks at that as the point where Ringo hit reset. Mm-hmm. Um, and my, my list ends up uh, leaning that way with only one of the five songs coming from at the Apple period. So I'll go with, start off with that one, a B-side, Down and Out, which I never understood why Down and Out was left off the Ringo album. Mm. It's a strong B-side. It's, no. it's a really great song. It's simple. Mm-hmm. But it's really catchy and it's a great song. It was a flip side for those who don't know, the flip side to photograph. And one of a handful, there's not many, but one of a handful of Ringo songs that are non album tracks. Although Down and Out's gotten some uh, attention because it's been issued as a bonus track on CDs because it was the B side of a big selling single. So, but that's the first one I'd pick. Um, and then we go to the more recent records. Uh, time Takes Time, one of Ringo's best albums. Uh, and again, another song that should have even then uh, got more attention, FM Airplay, is Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go. Mm-hmm. Uh, and a song I'd love to still see him playing live today. Mm-hmm. Even if he only did one or two songs from you know the later, the more recent years, that would be one that I think would definitely work. Don't Go Where the Road Don't Go. He did it on uh, a few of his tours. I'm sorry? He did it on a few of his all-star band tours. Yeah, no, that's what I mean. But not, you know, it's dude, really. that's that's almost like ancient history now. Yeah. Um, the third one is a cover that I liked a lot from an album that a lot of people criticized, but I liked it, uh, from Ringo 2012, uh, his cover of Rock Island Line. Which I, I love, and I and I really thought the Ringo 2012 album was good. It it may not make sense to some, but to me, the fact that it was such a short album, it was almost as if it was to the point. Uh, and in this case, maybe less was better. Ringo gave a concise, like what was it? Something like I think it was nine songs. Yep. It was a short album. It did what it had to do. It was over, and it was like to me. Um, I really love that album and that version of Rock Island Line uh, really kicked. I have to look things up these days. I don't remember like I used to. I mean, I, I preferred the remake of Wings to the original version. Um, I, I sort of step lightly. I sort of about the same um, and appreciated the fact that even though he had, there was no real reason that he should re-record Step Lightly, Mm-hmm. except that there actually would probably be some people that don't remember it from the first place. Um, Never heard it. In Liverpool was a, was, was a great one. Um, and it's funny because one of the weaker songs on the album, I felt, was the one that he was performing live was Anthem. But uh, Ringo 2012 was a record, I think, that uh, a lot of people I remember criticized it. And one of the reasons it was getting criticized it was nine songs. And he, and he did you know, new versions of two of his older tracks and there's covers. And I was like, you know what? But it works. It's concise. It has a punch to it, that album. And before it maybe drags or lags, it's over. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Rock Island Line is the third of my five songs. Uh, Then to Vertical Man for King of Broken Hearts, um, which is, that's a great song. That's another one that I think if, you could take the 70s mentality of music, radio, music buyers, you know, and insert these songs from the 90s in there. You probably are looking at what probably would be some some degree of a hit. Uh, and then my list ends with the title track to Choose Love. Uh, great rock song. And um, <clears throat> one that I played a lot of on WFUV when it came out and a uh, song that Ringo did also. He was performing that live. He has done it with the Oscars. You know, with, so, so Down and Out, Don't Go With The Road, Don't Go, Rock Island Line, King of Broken Hearts, and Choose Love. That's mm. my five. Okay. You know, I, 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 Alan kind of said this earlier, but to me, to the average person <laughs> out there, uh, anything that wasn't 
one of those seven top 10 singles from Ringo really could be considered obscure. Yeah. Um, I'd like to think that even every Beatle fan should have the Ringo album from 1973. Not everyone does. And there's album cuts on there that are really strong, not just the singles. So I would say even the singles after Goodnight Vienna are obscure to most people. Yeah. And I do remember hearing a dose of rock and roll on the radio. Yep. But still, I mean, you'll never hear it now unless you're listening to a show like mine or the Beatles channel on Sirius XM. Um, yeah, but uh, all great choices there, Darren. Don't go where the road don't go. Yeah. I love that one. And I think it was a really great song to do live. It was kind of like his no-no song <laughs> yeah. of, uh, of that time period, you know, to stay away from drugs and alcohol and all that. Um, so my top five, first of all, I just want to say that this is not my top five of all time here. This is just five random songs that I picked. And since we just did a show on Talk More Talk, my other podcast, which was from uh, Ringo's catalog from 2000 on, I wanted to make sure I didn't include any of those songs, you know? Um, yeah, I wanted to uh, highlight other songs that I didn't mention before specifically. So in the case of the Ringo album, um, I very often said that I think Six O'Clock is one of the greatest songs that he's done in his solo career. And apart from, I know that George Harrison co-wrote It Don't Come Easy and, and Photograph with Ringo, and it's, it's believed possibly back up Oogaloo. Um, but of all the songs that I think any of the other Beatles wrote for Ringo, I think Six O'Clock is the best of the bunch. Um, it's just a great melody. It flows so well. It's, um, it's got a great middle eight to it. I love the synthesizer solo in there. Um, and Paul and Linda's playing on it and their harmonies. Everything about that song is perfect. And, you know, I've often said the other Beatles really knew how to write well for Ringo with the possible exception of Cook It in the Kitchen of Love. But all the other ones are fine. Um, and Six O'Clock is really a brilliant song. And I kind of wish, you know, in those days to have three singles from an album, which is what Ringo had, was a lot. You know, it was starting to get that way with some albums. I wish there was a fourth single. And uh, I wish Six O'Clock was one of them. That really should be considered a classic in Ringo's uh, solo canon. I also picked a song from the Ringo, the fourth album, and um, it's one that I praise quite often and it's gave it all up. Um, the Ringo, the fourth album, I know it's been much maligned and I've always defended it because it's a major step in Ringo's career in the, in the sense that there's 10 tracks on there and six of the 10 were songs that he co-wrote with Vinnie Poncia. This was the first really big step I felt that Ringo made as a songwriter, even though he wrote those few songs with George and a few songs with Vinny before Ringo the fourth. Six out of 10 was the most up to that point and Gave It All Up was one of them. It's a very melancholy song. It's a song that I could hear people singing in a bar, lifting up their mug of beer um, about someone looking back at his life and the mistakes that he made. And um, it really suits Ringo's style. Um, Ringo's vocals aren't necessarily the best in this song, but um, I just think it's a great song and a really nice recording and arrangement of it. So Give It All Up would definitely be one of them. And, you know, I just said the song that Paul wrote for Ringo, Six O'Clock, was one of the best um, in Ringo's solo catalog. But there's another song that Paul wrote for Ringo. There's actually two that he wrote for Ringo on Stop and Smell the Roses. And one of them, I think, should be given attention. And it's the song, Attention. Uh, Paul wrote Private Property, the opening cut, and he also wrote the song, Attention, which I think is one of the, the catchiest melodies and very suitable for Ringo. Really great bass line coming from Paul. You can hear uh, Linda McCartney and Paul in the background, background vocals. Very catchy song. There's so many times that I've said certain songs in Ringo's catalog post Goodnight Vienna, if they were released as singles in the first half of the 70s, would have been big hits. I think Attention is definitely one of them. Um, you know, <laughs> who's been better at coming up with catchy melodies and hooks than Paul McCartney? And in this case, Attention is, is a real winner 
uh, and really works for Ringo. Also, in a heartbeat from Time Takes Time is one that I praise quite a lot through the years. Just like what I said about the first half of the 70s, if In a Heartbeat was a single, that would have been a top 10 hit. It was written by Diane Warren, who is one of the biggest you know, female songwriters of the last several decades. And uh, she actually uh, wrote another song that Ringo recorded recently, Here's to the Nights. But In a Heartbeat really has a very 60s feel to it. And um, Brian Wilson is on the song and backing vocals. And I've always said that it really has kind of like a don't worry baby kind of feel to it. The melody is infectious, great hooks. Just it would have been such a big top 40 hit. And I feel top 10 hit um, in the 70s and very well executed. The band that's on there is playing everything perfectly. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those songs that I feel has hit written all over it. And, um, you know, we can talk about Time Takes Time in another show. And I know we did that on my other podcast show. You know, it was on a small record label at the time, Private Music, who probably didn't have that much money to invest in promotion. But, um, you know, that whole album should have been, like yeah. what you said, Darren, like his Cloud Nine. Um, but in a no, hard... Pri private, pri I'm sorry, Private Music, when, when, when they had Ringo... Um, at WFUV, I knew some of their artists because we played Leo Kotke and Ricky Lee Jones. And now I don't remember. There was a few others. And it was a little bit of a, all right, is this, has Ringo dropped that he's resorted to an indie? Or have these indies really now, are they going to like really um, flourish as they grab these veteran acts now that are beginning to fall off? the major labels and I didn't see it coming that blind that private music was going to go under. Yeah. Uh, not long after time takes time came out. Cause it just seemed to be one of those indies that at least knew what they were doing. And weren't, we they, started we by, weren't they started by Peter Bauman from Tangerine dream. I, th I think that yes. was his, his label. I think so. There was a tie at the beginning to new age yep. with private music. Uh, and then they started to move towards the AAA radio format in the early 70s, in the early 90s. So Ricky Lee Jones, like I said, ended up there. Leo Kotke did a bunch of albums on private music. I think, I'm going to say this now, uh, I think Taj Mahal may have also been on private music. You're right. So um, around this time, and then Ringo was like, whoa, a former Beatle is on... So good for private music. Bing, out of business. And I remember Way to the World, the video was shown on VH1. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I don't remember Way to the World being played on the radio at all. And, um, you know, I was still listening to hit radio at the time, uh, as well as rock radio. And I barely heard Way to the World at all. If anything, it might have gotten a little bit of airplay on rock radio. Um which is really a shame. I mean, like you said, way to the world. <laughs> it, it, it's a hit record. It, any other time, especially in the 70s, when, when Ringo was doing so well, it would have done very well as a single. Yeah. And um, I could hear in a heartbeat as the next single. Okay. Um, so my fifth one, there's so many that I could pick. <laughs> um <laughs> I'm going to go with a recent one, Not Enough Love in the World, which is on Ringo's most recent EP. This Change one. the world. Uh, oh, zoom in. Yeah. Um, actually, no, this was the first EP. And this is a song that uh, was co-written by Steve Lukather. It's got a great hook in the chorus. And um, you just hear it once or twice and it's stuck in your head. That's another song that I feel, you know, has hit record written all over it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of great stuff he's put out throughout all these albums. And uh, I especially like the songwriting collaboration, although Ringo didn't co-write that with Steve Lukather. He wrote that with uh, another guy from Toto, Joe Williams. And 
Yeah, so those would be my five. Believe me, I could have picked so many more. There's a lot scattered throughout all of his solo albums, and I think they all deserve, you know, your attention. But the great thing, as I said in my other podcast show, unlike the old days, when you heard a song on the radio and you liked it and you wanted to hear it again, you had to wait a while before the radio station would play the song. These days, you don't have to wait at all. <laughs> Just go to YouTube, click on the song, and there you go. <laughs> you can tell for yourself whether or not you like the song or not. Listen to it several times. And then uh, I'd love to hear back from you guys watching or listening to this show. If you listen to any of these songs, if there's any that grabbed you that you never heard before, I'd certainly love to hear it. You know, we love all the feedback here on this program. And part of the reason why we do what we do is to hopefully have our, our fans uh, gain a bigger appreciation for what uh, the four Beatles have given us, group and solo. But, um, you know, all four Beatles have given us tremendous catalogs in their solo career. And Ringo, you know, it may shock a lot of people, but he's put out 20 studio albums. Yeah. Plus the two EPs. Plus, as Alan mentioned, Scouse the Mouse. Yeah. I mean, what more do you want in a catalog? <laughs> uh, it's quite a lot that he's given us since uh, the Beatle, the Beatle years and uh, a lot of worthwhile tracks and these are just some of them that we just mentioned so if you can check them out if you never heard them before on youtube check out the ones that we mentioned on my other podcast talk more talk mm -hmm. all right so I wanna, if i just could just uh, you were right alan because uh, then i got curious about private music it was peter bauman's label mm -hmm. and was started more so as a label for acts like ravi shankar and, and, and Yanni and Andy Summers solo. Uh, and then they went on and, and, and ended up, I was right about Taj Mahal, uh, but completely forgot that uh, uh, Leon Redbone and um, not uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber though, uh, were on private music. Um, who was it? John Tesh was on private music. Oh dear. <laughs> See, that was their mistake. If they had had Andrew Lloyd Webber, they might have survived. Edda James, uh, A.J. Croce, Jim Croce's son. Uh -huh. uh, Dan Zanes was on uh, uh, Toots Steelman's. That's right. I remember that. Jazz uh, harmonica player. So, mm -hmm. But the label didn't actually, I don't think it, I said it went belly up. I think it just got absorbed into other labels. Uh, but, you know. I was still found it interesting that they couldn't get more out of time takes time mm -hmm. because it wasn't like a, it wasn't really a small, you know, it was a pretty big indie label. Anyway, mm -hmm. I digress. All right. So uh, before we go, let's have each of us uh, give our own contact information and uh, let us know what each of us is up to. Darren. You usually have a full plate. Well, uh, I have some good news. Um, my Monday through Thursday night show on WFUV for a number of years actually was always the way it was divvied up uh, 10, 10 p.m. till 2 a.m., four hour shift, uh, which I was moved into, I believe it was during the summer of 2015, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Uh, but when the pandemic set in, March 2020, uh, because everybody, and not just at FUV, I mean, everybody started working remotely and radio broadcasters started broadcasting from home. There was some technical issues, which I don't even pretend to understand, uh, that forced uh, matters where my show had to stop at midnight. It had to do with, I don't know, changing of the clock. And the uh, so um, my 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. was trimmed to 10 to midnight and that's the way it's been since march 2020 but i'm happy that it'll be back to four hours starting monday uh which would be the 25th if i'm not mistaken i don't know when you're watching uh this but on the 25th uh mm -hmm. i'm back to 10 p till 2 a uh monday through thursday nights and then saturday afternoons 1 to 4 p.m on wfuv 90.7 fm uh, in the New York City metro area, or go to WFUV.org and stream us there anywhere, 
We have an app too you can get. Uh, if you want to shoot me an email, um, write me at WFUV. Uh, Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org is the email address. Or I have two Facebook pages. Uh, Darren DeVivo, send me a friend request. The other page, uh, f- click follow. And, um, and we will see then there. Uh, so that's that. Is that your favorite Heidi Booner's line? <laughs> it's one of them that comes out a lot. You're using it quite a lot here on the show. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but hey, it, it can core a apple. So <laughs> everything on that show is a classic. So it works here. Alan, how about you? Okay. Well, <clears throat> what I was up to was working on volume two of McCarty Legacy. And then they sent us the PDF to read of volume one. So the past week I've been reading volume one again. Now I'm ready to get back into volume two. Um, so it's sort of a McCartney universe around here. Um, you can um, get in touch with me at uh, fa- on Facebook, either at Alan Cozen, plain old Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, McCartney Legacy also has a Facebook page and website and um, you know pop in see what's going on we occasionally post things uh, you know related to what's happening and um, meanwhile with all of us you can contact us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com that's one word things we said today radio show at gmail.com we have a twitter feed at things we said fab and um, a multiplicity of Facebook pages. Well, two. Um, things We Said Today, easy enough. And Things We Said Today, Beatles radio fans. Um, please subscribe to us on YouTube if you haven't already. And if you want just the audio version, um, we're on Podbean and uh, iTunes and Podbean sends them around. So uh, all sorts of other places where fine podcasts can be heard. That's it for me. All right. Thank you, Alan. All right. If you want to get in contact with me, you can do so by email. My address is everylittlething at att.net. I also have a Facebook page, Ken Michaels. I just want to make a a bit of an announcement here because I I mentioned this on my Facebook page today. Um, My syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, is heard on over 50 radio stations, um, many of which are internet only radio stations. I was just picked up by a radio station called Mersey Radio. Hmm. And it will be broadcast for the first time this Thursday, which is July the 21st. Uh, They're going to run two shows back to back every Thursday from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Eastern time. The only reason I mention this is because this radio station is actually based out of Liverpool. Nice. So I feel like I finally made it after 40 years of doing this show. And, um, you know, in this day and age, I mean, I've always been taught, you know, with AM and FM, it matters what market you're in and the size of your market. Well, that is still true in terms of getting advertising and all, but just about every single radio station on the planet now you can stream. So whether we're talking about a station out in Kansas or in Australia or now in Liverpool, that's the great thing about the Internet. You can hear a show like Every Little Thing on so many different radio stations. Um, You can never hear the show on demand. But the show is streamed live on a, over 50 stations, like I said. And you can check out my website, which is kenmichaelsradio.com. There's a page there for every little thing. It lists all the radio stations, the broadcast times, and links to their websites so you can stream the show. So Liverpool, to Liverpool with love, here I come. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, also on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio, I've been busy with a number of interesting interviews. First of all, there's Rick Glover, who we all know. He's a, a frequent writer for Beatle Fan magazine. And uh, he, along with a group of Beatle fans called Fans on the Run, have gone to many a Paul McCartney show and solo Beatle show. And um, Rick was a guest. I did an interview with him on my YouTube channel. 
he is, at least to me, I don't know anyone who's seen as many concerts of Paul McCartney as Rick Glover has. And uh, the latest count is 159. Wow. Okay. He's told me he knows a few people who have said they've seen him more. So we reflect on uh, the concerts that he's seen. Uh, we highlight the special ones, especially the more intimate ones. Uh, the very first concert he ever saw was of uh, from the Wings Over America tour in Atlanta. He has a very uh, interesting story because um, I won't give too much away, but he had tickets for the two shows in Atlanta back to back. How he handled the second show, well, you'll have to watch the interview for that. But it's all about seeing Paul on the road and we both share our own memories of that. Um, in addition to uh, Rick Glover, there's Ken Womack, who, as I said earlier, is about to put out two books on Mal Evans, the first of which hopefully will be Father's Day next year. So it was all discussing Mal's life and some of the things that we'll learn in, in uh, the two books that will be coming out. And, you know, Ken is just a great speaker, always, always a lot of fun and sheer delight to talk to Ken. You can pick that up on uh, my, my YouTube channel as well. I just did a show right before recording this one, which is part of my Young Blood series. That's when I interview people uh, in the Beatle world who are 40 and under, the younger Beatles fans, to get their perspective on things. In this case, I interviewed Skylar Moody, and she's someone that you might have just seen at the Fest for Beatles fans. She has her own TikTok channel, which has a lot of Beatles content on it. And she just started her own George Harrison podcast, okay, called Apple Scruffs. She's on the show. Dylan Seavey is on the show. He's been a guest on my YouTube channel and on the Two Legs podcast. Really knowledgeable musician when it comes to the Beatles, the group, and the solo years. He can talk a mile a minute on their music and on their history. He shares so much insight and I love having him on the show. And Sam Wiles, who does a Paul McCartney podcast called Paul or Nothing. He's been on uh, my YouTube channel as well. Um, and I posed the question or questions and I did this once before. If you could attend the recording sessions of any Beatles album, which one would you pick? And then the flip side of that, if you could attend the sessions of any solo Beatle album, which one would you pick? You know, whether you're talking to a young Beatle fan or an older one, that might be one that we should do here on this show, because I'd love yeah, to hear, yeah. you know, what your thoughts are. And especially in the case of these three guests, the answers are not going to be what you would expect in some cases. So, um, again, that's on my YouTube channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the last show, but I did an interview with Jay Bergen, who yeah. was John Lennon's defense attorney during the whole uh, copyright infringement lawsuit um, with Morris Levy over uh, Come Together, using a line from Come Together. This is an amazing book to read, and uh, you really do feel like you're in the courtroom with John because it has the actual transcripts of everything that John said on the witness stand for this, uh, for this trial. Wonderful book to read, and uh, Jay was a fantastic guest on my YouTube channel. Again, that's Ken Michaels Radio. There'll be another Talk More Talk, a solo Beals video cast coming next Monday, which happens to be July 25th. We do it live, 9 p.m. Eastern time on our YouTube channel. Talk More Talk, a solo Beals video cast. It's going to be um, a show that we've been contemplating doing for a while, and it has to deal with John and Paul and how the public's opinions about them through the years have changed. Um, it's not a John versus Paul show, but just um, how the public's attitude, how they think differently now of Paul and John, right or wrong. <laughs> we all just debate this whole thing. And I'm, I think that's going to be a real fun show. My website is kenmichaelsradio.com. And uh, always check that out for audio interviews that I've done in the past from people uh, connected with the Beatles and weekly Beatles trivia. There's one page on there every week where you can win one of 10 really great prizes like CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, books, you name it. So again, that's KenMichaelsRadio.com. I think that covers everything here. So uh, 
This has been fantastic. A belated happy birthday to Ringo Starr. Happy 82nd. And uh, on behalf of Darren and Alan, I'm Ken Michaels. Thanking all of you for watching. And peace and love. Take care, everyone.